So this evening we're going to think about uh, British war artists. Um, and I'll begin by saying a little bit and then we'll move on to looking at quite a few images. Hopefully we'll get through all that we need to, but um, we'll see how far we get. But initially, just to um, just to begin, um, to welcome everybody here, um, the government during World War One did not support the idea to offer contracts of employment for artists to produce specific works. But this changed when both Nash and Nevinson began to exhibit paintings which had specific focuses on the war. And then the painting that we're looking at, which we'll come to in a moment, uh, done in 1916 by Eric Kennington. Uh, this work was shown, it's called the Kensingtons at the Venti, um, and it caused an absolute sensation. So much so that Charles Masterman, who headed the British War Propaganda Bureau, was prompted to take the idea further. Um, First World War, we have to remember, was quite unusual in terms of the type of war that it was, and this whole sort of concept of propaganda via press and other 20th century means. So William, uh, having decided to take the idea further, Charles Masterman then took advice from William Rothenstein and eventually appointed Muirhead Bone as the first official war artist. Then in 1917, other artists were sent to the front to record the war, including Rothenstein and Orpen and Lavery. Uh, and just one little um, aside is that Orpen actually went as um, a major. Most of the artists, when they went, went as second lieutenants, uh, but Orpen, because he was um, going to be there for longer than the usual three week slots, went as a major. But they, Three artists were involved from 1917. And then in 1918, the British War Memorials Committee, or the BWMC, was established. And the Department of Information became the Ministry of Information and was headed by Lord Beaverbrook. And its aim was, uh, to quote, to produce a lasting memorial to the war. Beaverbrook also assisted in creating the Canadian War Records Office in London. Beaverbrook is Canadian, of course, uh, as, well as, um, as well as establishing a collection um, of war art and the Canadian War Memorials Fund, which then evolved into a second official arts programme. Um, and from that, a collection of war art was developed by both the British and Canadian painters and sculptors. Beaverbrook had visited the Western Front. He went with the honorary rank of Colonel in the Canadian Army, which resulted in uh, his 1916 book, Canada in Flanders, which went actually into three volumes. So that's sort of a brief back background of the, of the war art. Um, so we're going to begin by looking at um, two or three images by Eric Kennington. And as I said, we'll be quite diverse because artists did respond. I mean, there is always that problematic. We mentioned Nash. Well, that was Paul Nash. And he went as an official war artist after having actually uh, been in Ypres, being luckily wounded before his battalion were actually wiped out coming back and going back. But his brother, John, uh, John Nash is very much going up in the world at the moment. And in fact, when galleries open again, the towner in um, Eastbourne is, has got a John Nash exhibition waiting, waiting, waiting to go. But uh, John, John Nash was actually um, working uh, or uh, work, serving as a soldier. He didn't have formal art training. So in lots of ways, he probably had more first-hand information uh, than Paul, although Paul had been there earlier, but then returns as a war artist. So the Eric Kennington image that we're, we're looking at, Kennington was enlisted in 1914. Um, he fought and was wounded in 1915 and then came back to the United Kingdom. Um, he 
So we said, showed this painting in, eight, in 1916, and it, it caused an, an absolute sensation. Um, it was of his own infantry, infantry platoon, uh, the number 7C company, and it's painted in reverse. It's actually painted on glass, so he painted it in reverse. And it's got a bystander or a self-portrait. He is the third figure from the right uh, wearing the balaclava. Uh, sorry, third figure from the left. Yeah, from the right of the painting wearing the balaclava, the figure right in the, right in the centre. Um, so he comes, he's fought, he comes back in 1950, produces this particular piece of work and then goes back as a war artist in 1916. But it was really through this and the response to this image that um, the whole concept of producing something, a body uh, of, of work uh, and a body of variety of work that was decided on. Um, I said about, or we've mentioned about propaganda and information. One of the briefs was that you had to valorise the British soldier. And we'll see that when you actually um, moved away from that, it became quite problematic. So there was that valorisation of, of the soldier. But here, as we can see, Kennington is just showing soldiers as, as he experienced it. So that it's an image that, whilst it appears real, um, it's a response to his, uh, his own understanding and his own experiences of the war. So we're just going to have a look at a couple of other images by Kennington. Um, so that's his uh, Kensington's at Leventi. Uh, and a little sketch, which he actually calls a Bantam Hercules. So this one is done in 1917. Um, and we can see how he has that empathy. So he's back in 1916 and he has that empathy um, with the men that he actually served with. It's something that he has first hand information of. And he shows us in a, a sketch form and it, it's much more immediate. When an artist does a sketch, it's much more immediate perhaps than a finished painting. It's your first response. But actually elevating the figure. You know, these, these men, as he's suggesting, are um, heroic figures. Um, so that's in 1917. And then similarly, in 1917, whoops, reflect two. Um, similarly, in 1917, uh, an engraving, which is in the trenches and showing that that first hand experience of being in the trenches. As we know, many um, not only artists, but many soldiers went off to war defending king and country. Uh, also, they were um, given, many of them were carried with them, oh, heroic books about war and great deeds and, and great men. And obviously the recruitment by the PALS regiments and um, the promises that were given. Um, we know that the experience of war was something different. Stanley Spencer, who we'll hopefully finish with this evening, is probably one of the few where it was the greatest, greatest um, excitement of his life. And he talks in his diaries of getting the train and um, you know, having seen all this countryside. And of course, this is a man who very rarely left his home uh, town of Cookham except to go to the Slade. And would always get the last train back. He had to. He had to be back home. And it might be worth saying that a lot of the artists we're going to look at this evening were actually members of the Slade. So we looked at a couple of images by Kennington, um, mostly now remembered because of the first him producing the first war image that had public display. So we're going to look at um, three or four images now by Muirhead Bone. And all of the artists so far um, are on survive the war and, and live. And Kennington lives until the 60s and Muirhead Bone until uh, 1953. So as you said, Muirhead Bone was the person that they actually, when it was decided to do this, they actually um, took um, advice from William Rothenstein, put him forward. And he was the first official war artist. Now, well, this is a 1916 blasted trees. So we've got two ways of looking at these images. 
uh, either symbolically or we can think of them as, as literal. Um, symbolically, the blasted tree within ours is a symbol of a life cut short. Now, we can locate that back. A lot of you have studied in that area to so the 17th century. So it's, it's a symbol which is well established within, um, within painted images or, or imagery. But we have to also think how realistically this was the landscape that Muirhead Bone would have seen when he first visited all of the areas around which the fighting was going on, both in Belgium and in France. Now, the paintings that we've looked at, the images we've looked at so far, are reasonably representational. Some artists chose this, whereas other artists, particularly people like Paul Nash, who'd been a landscape painter before the war, felt that painting in a representational way didn't really offer um, quite enough to actually capture the experience. They found that using a much more modernist technique, and many of them moved towards um, what we think of as cubism, um, or that cubist agenda, and we'll come to this a little bit later, captured what they were trying to, to give to the viewer, to the, to, for, for, the pe for people to look at. Because we, of course, are only being presented with things and hopefully are going to get some kind of feedback. So here we've got the blasted trees. And then we're back to that idea of the ruin. This, these, these four are by uh, your head bone. This is the ruins of the church in Peron, done in, 19, in 1917. Now here too, we've got an image which would fit very easily in with the 17th, 17th century Capricci, uh, 18th century uh, people um, oh, such as Piranesi, those sort of images of, of, of Rome in, in the 18th century. And of course, with the, the 19th century Romantic imagery. So it's something that, that's well established. We have the blasted tree and the room. So we've got something that's literal, but it also has that symbolic gesture. Uh, and the idea of a ruin within romanticism, romantic imagery, uh, is that, you know, if sort of great edifices and great civilizations can fall into ruin, then what are we? We are, you know, we are just, just tiny little things. And it's very much um, a reminder of mortality. In this case, of course, the mortality was something that was an everyday experience as well. And it was something that was way beyond expectation. And in fact, um, although we won't look at it this evening, um, the, the idea of having a memorial to fallen soldiers um, was something that came out of the First World War. And in fact, the Cenotaph was going to be a memorial to the sons of the dead peers of the realm. At the end of the war, it was realised that there were so many dead sons um, that they needed actually to expand it and for that to be a much more generic thing. So we'll just look at another couple of um, images. This is his impressions of Rance or Reem. So here again, you've got you know, the, the effects of war and we have to we have to remember that this is something that is a new experience and something that is being um, experienced firsthand. But you're actually trying to get this back to, to the viewer. And just, just one other, your head bone, which is his, he calls this open doors. These are all 1917. Uh, the fact that they are not painted gives it a kind of veracity uh, when things are often done in black and white, whether it's an engraving or a drawing, seems to engage the viewer and think of more as a, an immediacy. And here we have uh, the, war, the war effort going on outside and the, uh, you know, the two officers sitting inside just slightly away from, from the war effort. OK, so we're going to move now to think about the work done by Wyndham Lewis. And we've said about different techniques. Uh, Wyndham Lewis was uh, Canadian by, by birth. Um, he 
probably people or people here may remember Lewis as being one of the the impetuses behind Vorticism. Uh, he come to England. He he was at the Slade. Um, he was part of the Camden Town Group. He's then in the Amiga workshop um, with the Charleston um, group. So you've got this, this coming together. And he has a terrible falling out with Roger Fry. He'd actually shown his work in the two post-impressionist exhibitions. But he has a real falling out with Roger Fry. He accused Fry of um, giving the work to his own group that Wyndham Lewis actually called the traditional modernists, whereas he calls himself and his followers the radical modernists. So he breaks away from Fry, forms vorticism with Ezra Pound. Uh, the Rebel Arts Centre he founds in 1914, and that was really opposing um, Omega. Um, and during the uh, war, they actually published two um, two books or two versions of something called Blast, in which they looked um, quite radically at the good and the bad, and they blasted this and blessed others. You can still get holes, holes of those. They were published in 1914 and 1915. Similarly, he became um, affiliated with Marinetti. Now, Marinetti was the leader uh, of the Italian Futurists, but he came to speak at the Lyceum in London um, and it was both Lewis and Nevinson that welcomed Marinetti. So what we're what we're looking at here is a, an image called a battery shelled by Wyndham Lewis. And you can see that for Lewis, he's he's using a modern technique and he's he's stylizing what we're looking at. Um, we've got the officers who are more representational to the left. Uh, here to one very nonchalant, uh, hands in his pockets, looking out at, at you know what's going on, just um, gazing at the the landscape or the mud. Other one looking away. Another one looking down with his um, with uh, with his pipe in his hand. Now Lewis had actually been in the war, so he knew what it was about, and um, it had rather enraged him in, in many ways. He'd been on the Western Front. He'd actually been given the post of the forward observation post, uh, looking at the German lines. In 1917, he was in the Third Battle of Ypres and then becomes an official war artist, both for the United Kingdom and for Canada. Um, he, in 1937, he actually writes a book about his experiences called blasting and bombardiering. But here he breaks down the soldiers, as you can see, to almost ant-like figures. I mean, these, these, are, these are the people who are dying, doing the work, but they are just part of a war machine. He's using this machine-like imagery. Um, and even the mud, we can see, is extremely stylized. Um, so here's an example of an artist who'd been quite radical in his approach, who'd gone down the, uh, the Cubo-Futurist route, had made a big stand with British art, but then having experienced the war himself, using all of these techniques and all of his experience to capture his, his, his ideas of the war here. In fact, one critic, um, although this kind of technique and style was not really appreciated in Britain. But one critic did say that had Wyndham Lewis produced this outside of England, it would probably have been far more privileged that it wasn't really appreciated here. Um, so we're just going to look at a couple of other images by, uh, by Wyndham Lewis. Two of the people that he was influenced by in terms of uh, philosophers, one was Friedrich Nietzsche, and many artists that get involved um, both in using cubism and certainly in terms of this more, these more radical techniques. Nietzsche was the, the guiding force behind that. One of his statements about in order to create, we must first destroy. Um, so you take, if we think about taking that 
picture on the world that we think of as Renaissance art, smashing that to pieces and then putting it back together again. But here we've got two or three images which bring together what we've said about Lewis. There's experiences of war, but this stylization of uh, men into machines so that they, they just become part of the of the war effort. And then the blasted trees in the in the background. Um, and here we have, as we can see, um, another take, but we're now inside and we've got a different viewpoint. And it's quite interesting here that he's included a black figure as well, uh, something that was not always part of the process, but he's actually taken this. And it, it's very similar to some of the figures that he may have seen in Frank Brangwyn's. Now, Frank Brangwyn and Muirhead Bone were quite close, and some of their imagery is is very similar. Brangwyn had done some, you know, the idea of the heroic male figure, um, and Lewis has certainly worked from that here. Um, so as we can see, it's a little more representational, but it it's very much about the war effort. Um, sometimes when the war effort isn't that that idea of um, we hurry up and wait, but here, you know, people are, as we can see, preparing for what is to for what is to come. Okay, and we've just got one uh, one other um, blast. We're just going to go through these. Um, seeing here how Lewis, using his now you know, very recognisable images, is showing a blast uh, quite literally, um, and it. It's the, 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 both the, the blast, and we could say that the sort of lights that were often came from that become a motif of the, of the war. Okay, so to move on to Christopher Nevinson. Nevinson is another Slade student. Now, he'd actually shared a studio in Paris with Modigliani uh, in 1914. He comes back to um, England and he becomes very friendly with Marinetti and in fact, together with Marinetti, writes the vital, um, a, um, a book called Vital English Art. It, it was really a manifesto of English futurism. But Nevinson too um, enlisted and he, one of the things that forced him to do that was that his father was involved um, in the war effort and he actually went, he travelled with his father and he was horrified at what he saw. Uh, he had friends, including his father, who were worked as medics or worked in the ambulance unit and he actually joins up as uh, a member of the, the Friends Ambulance Unit in, in World War I. He goes to France as, as a driver and he found it very disturbing. He goes on to say uh, the, he talks about the shambles in Dunkirk, where he said there were 3,000 wounded and the horror of those that were unfed, dead or dying. Um, he worked then with the Royal, uh, Royal Army Medical Corps in, in Britain and actually suffered from shell shock himself. Uh, he was hospitalised, but he, um, by 1917, he goes back to the Western Front as a as a war artist. Uh, and we can see with um, Nevinson that he too is using, rather than a, a realistic or a representational imagery, he's using what we would think of as uh, a modern um, a modern technique, a modern grammar, a modern syntax or language, which he too felt was something um, far more real. I mean, to, to quote him, he talks about uh, the world of men enslaved to a terrific machine of their own making. He actually does an image with that with that title. Uh, this one is called uh, La, La, Milit, uh, La Milit, Militaires. Um, so here, and he then goes on um, to, to say about, you know, how um, this, this, this machine that these men are, are enslaved to, that it's something that you have to be there to experience. But here too, we're below, he's, he's taking us in inside the trench. 
um, and he's he's letting us see the you know the concentration and using using this technique. So we look at a two or three more. This one's done in 1915. Um, this is his 1960 troops resting. So we've got a slightly lighter palette, but as we said, it's very similar in its take. And you'll notice how these artists who've experienced war are, are not glorifying war. We were chatting just a little, a little early before we started um, about the war poetry. Um, and the war poetry is basically you know, the love poetry of the 20th century. And it's, it's really only the John McRae, which encourages um, soldiers to take up their arms, uh, whereas most of the war poetry uh, is very anti-war, takes that totally ironic twist on it. And of course, you know, we have people like Sassoon, you know, having his declaration read out in Parliament and then throwing his war medals away. Um, so you've got all that in the background and you'll find with the war artists it's a, it's very similar there's 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 no valorization you know they're doing something which is which is very different um so here um here we've got marching or marching or off to the front so here too we've got an image which got quite a high viewpoint um we're looking down it's leading us in the way technically the composition um, and he's showing this this almost like um, a flood we can think of we can think of this as a townscape um, and we've, we've got this 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 river of bodies all um, no one really being individualized all parts of this this war machine and here too we've got this um you know off to this off to the off to the trenches uh return to the front you know he does he does numerous takes on what he'd experienced himself and what he'd actually seen and here too as you can see you've got people who are tired uh they're resting they they they've got they're standing up they've got what they um Know, what they stand up in basically and then that suggestion of the, the searchlight effect and you'll see how he uses you know quite sharp perspective here as well it leads the viewer in but it's also enclosed the images or the figures within the within this within the space um, and probably one of his one of the um, images that we might think of as more in line with Cubo futurism and in fact there is a an image futurist image of the troops um uh, of the young girl marching um on a balcony which is very similar to this and the way um what you're doing is is taking cubism which is the new formal grammar or language but then propelling it across the page so that you've got this sort of feeling of movement in a static uh, in a static image so let's just have a Nevinson here who's got it 19, 1960. And one case in the last image that we wanted to look at is of Nevinson is Paths of Glory, which is a totally, as you can see, different style, different take. Um, it is an ironic title. And because he'd shown dead soldiers, dead British soldiers, and here you've got the, you know, the barbed wire, the fencing behind. When it was when it was going to be shown, it was actually censored, and it had a big piece of paper stuck across it so that it was not able to be shown because it had actually dealt with not only um, the waiting, the the walking, the war machine, but the dead bodies and the the reality or the unheroic nature of war. So these are Christopher Christopher Nevinson, and here, as you can see, we've got the image with censored across it. Okay, so we're just going to look at a couple of images now by John Lavery, that dipping in and out of um, the various war war artists and their and their response um, their response to the war itself. 
Um, and Lavery was um, another artist that went along and worked alongside the war. He's he he's actually um, Irish. Um, he didn't he didn't actually because he had very bad health, but he wanted to be involved. Uh, the brief that Lavery was given was that he could actually paint the soldiers who were returned back to England. And this is what we're looking at here. So what we're thinking about, this is the, the wounded or the first wounded. This is done about uh, about 19, 19, between 1914 and 1916. As you can see, he's got quite a subdued palette um, and he's showing so that you've got you know, the soldier in, in the wheelchair, the soldier walking across in the background, someone actually being cared for here in the foreground. But the reality of those who did return um, and of course the nursing and all that all that went with it. So these were more acceptable because these people have come back, you know, they're able to be uh, decorated, they've got their war tales, etc. But it's um, what we're looking at is the, the the damaged body, but not the dead body. That that was the problem. Um, in fact, that that went right across the, the ball. And in fact, probably one of the first images um, of dead soldiers was in the American Civil War, which were photographs uh, from the mid mid nineteenth century. And in fact, some of um, or the image that we've just been looking at was very similar to some of those uh, some of those images, but you could show a dead German soldier, but not a dead English soldier. So we just look at these couple uh, of lavery. Um, here, these are the the wounded at Dover. So you've got the you know the train, the Red Cross coming in. Um, very similar, as we can see, to some of the peasant painting. And in fact, we see with the Nash brothers that both of them, and in fact John Singer Sargent, look to some of the 17th century realist painting of people like Peter Bruegel. So here you've got quite subdued colouring um, and Lavery using, you know, using these as a, uh, in a manner to um, try and get across the reality of people coming back from the war uh, at, this, uh, at this, this particular point. So we're just going to have a look. I think we've got another, another one of his. Yeah, this is uh, just, just uh, one other um, he, this is a tap uh, post-war image, which he calls Happy Days, um, and this is, you know, after the war. So the train going through the countryside, and of course the the rows and rows of crosses, and I think I have a photograph here as well. So he's probably worked from the photograph. So here we have a, you know, a literal photograph. We've got the blasted trees in the background, um, and him using using that. Um, and then giving it that ironic title of you know, Etat Happy Days. Okay, so Mark Gertler. Um, Mark Gertler's Merry-Go-Round, 1916. Uh, probably one of the one of the images, uh, or one of the war images uh, that's in Tate Britain and is probably uh, the painting that uh, Gertler is remembered for. I mean, Goethe um, had been he'd been involved in the war himself. Uh, he's al he'd also been at the Slade. He'd been uh, invalided out. But you know what we're looking for. And he's someone else who talks about having how um, the war had destroyed his faith in in machines. This idea of mechanized slaughter. Um, so. What we're looking uh, what we're looking looking at here is the merry-go-round done in 1916, and it's it's if we, if we see and we we talked about stylization, but we can see how we've got something else that is a machine, but it's almost like an infernal machine from which you are not going to be able to be removed. And if you look at the the horses, I mean it. When we think of a merry-go-round, you immediately think of laughter and pleasure and leisure. Well, that's not what's going on here. We've got people dressed in, as we can think of, army uniform. We've got people dressed as, as sailors. We've got figures that 
are almost like siphons. They're, they're static. Um, they have their mouths open, but it's a silent scream. Meanwhile, the merry-go-round continues. And if you look at the, the horses, you can see that he stylized the legs so that they almost look like rifles. So he's taking uh, a concept using that, but making a very strong statement of anti-war by doing so. Um, his use of colour is quite interesting here too. It's mostly, as we can see, in shades of um, shades of, of blues, but he's using red to pick it out. He unifies the canvas so that we've got the car key or the gold, the blue and the red, but he's using it to, to unify the canvas. Um, and it's a kind of horror that engages. And in fact, certain people have said how um, that, that silent scream uh, is something that very much captures how soldiers felt. Often when they came back, and we've just seen some images of them coming back, they were not perhaps able to um, to really talk about their war experiences, and they would be told uh, what a bad time people had had here, um, and they had to really go along with that, so much so that many of them, after being um, brought back, wanted to go back to the front because it was the only way that you could make sense of this experience. We mentioned uh, Sassoon before, and of course Sassoon uh, wanted to go back to be with his men uh, when he got, uh, got out of Craig Lockhart, of course. Okay, so we are continuing. And we're going to look at a couple of images now uh, by John Nash, and I mentioned John Nash. Uh, the two Nash brothers, John, um, as I said, was um, both both men were were enlisted. Uh, John actually had no official artistic training, although he was part of the London group. He joined the Artist Rifles uh, and he fought from 1916 to 1918. He was at Cambrai uh, and at Passchendaele. So this is someone who had first-hand experiences of the war. Um, and what we're, we're looking at is... is, is Again, the view from inside the trenches. Some of you who've been there know that um, sanctuary ward. There are a few places. A lot of the trenches are now uh, very sanitised, but there are a few places such, such as sanctuary ward that's not far from Eep, um, and they are the German trenches where you can still get that experience of what these places were like, and which still has uh, blasted trees surround in the surrounding area. So here you've got. A kind of wasteland, and of course the the wasteland, as in Elliot's wasteland, comes out of this. And in fact, we'll have a look a couple of images a little bit uh, a little bit later of David Jones, who can very much be connected with with Elliot. So just to have a look at a couple of these by John Nash, and probably his most famous image, which he did in 1917, uh, which is called Over the Top, and I'm sure. Quite a few of you will make the connections here um, with the hunter's return. You've seen this before. Nash has this experience. He's gone over the top. He's been part of that. Um, what he's showing us is this snowy landscape with this great fissure in the in the earth. Soldiers, earth coloured, climbing out. And then the three soldiers in the foreground are taken from Bruegel. So you've got that connection back to the 16th century, um, the hunter's return. And here he's making that you know, ironic connection that what are soldiers? You know, they're, they're going out to hunt and to kill other men who are very similar to themselves. But it's a strong painting. And as we said, John Nash himself um, was someone who had two years experience, wasn't going as, um, as an official war artist, and ironically had more experience than his, than his, brother, uh, than his brother Paul. On the Bruegel painting, 
is say a 1656. 1565 or 1565. Okay, so we're going to look at Paul Nash now anyway. Uh, Nash went to the Slade, he also went to St Paul's and then he went on to Chelsea College of Art. But in 1914 he enlisted and he was um, in the 2nd Battalion of the Artist Rifles. Um, he initially was given guard duty at the Tower of London, so that was, you know, he had, a, he had a sort of sinecure job. But in 1917, he is sent to the Western Front um, and he's actually uh, sent to, the, to Ypres and he's going to be part of the, um, the, the salient there. He actually fell, had an accident, he broke some ribs and was sent back to England. I mean, this sounds ironic because, you know, you think of the um, the horror and the um, how the, quite literally the shattered body. I mean, we're not looking here, but if we were looking at people like Otto Dix and George Gross, you know, they show the, the real shattered bodies and, and how people were literally put together. They've been taken apart by machines and are put together by other machines. Uh, but he um, he comes back to England, he's sent back to England. Um, the, his battalion um, went just a few days later to Hill 60 and they were all killed. So Nash would have been killed had he been there. Uh, in 1917, he actually goes back to Ypres and has this tremendous anger uh, with the war. He later worked with the Canadians at Vimy. Now, Nash had been um, a landscape painter in the, um, what we might think of as a, a, in a realistic manner. It, he always used to talk about this sense of place. He was never very good with figures. So landscape was his, um, you know, this, that was his ooh. But he too was an artist who changed his technique in response to the war, to war experiences. The painting we're looking at here is called We Are Making a New World, uh, painted in 1918. There are two or three different versions of this, but the title, as we can see, you know, We Are Making a New World, that idea of uh, a war, a good war, a war uh, to end all wars, a war being for God is on our side, all of that rhetoric that soldiers were given. Nash had seen at first hand, he'd also lost his battalion. He knows that you know, only for having an accident, he too would, would not have been alive. So what he's showing us is this is the new world. We've got the sun um, shining, the sun is rising and spreading its rays around this landscape. The landscape if we look at the way he shaped the mud, they are like helmets. They almost represent um, figures that are buried beneath the mud. Then we've got the blasted tree. And in the foreground, the little, you've got these two pools of water in the foreground. The tree that is leaning um, into the water and it's got two little prongs. He took that, many artists take Take motifs from other, from other painters. They actually took that from a painting by Caspar David Friedrich. Now, Friedrich was the German Romantic painter. Um, and what Nash has done is looked to Romanticism. He started by saying how you know, the ruin, uh, the tree, all of those things are, are things that the Romantics use because what the Romantics were doing was trying to deal with the uncertainty of the of the here and now. I mean, they're painting at the beginning and writing their poetry at the beginning of the 19th century, when, as William Blake said, uh, science had taken away faith, but given them nothing in return. Well, this is perhaps what Nash is doing here and saying, well, no, this is where, this is what science, this is what mechanization, this is where machinery has led. We've got this this wasteland, this 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 field of mud, um, and he's relating this back to that romantic tradition, which was far more uh, how he painted initially. His you know his early works were 
were very much in that romantic, British romantic landscape tradition. And then his Men in Road, also of 1918. Uh, the Men in Road, those of you who've, who've been to Ypres know that um, uh, the Men in Road now, of course, you've got the Men in Gase, and you have the um, every night the last post posters played, and people lay wreaths, and you, know, you can go and find the uh, the names of uh, your perhaps relatives or people that have died or, or gave their lives. So it's now part of that memorialization of war. But this was the men in road that um, Nash knew about. Now here too, this is very much a landscape painter. Uh, what, we're, what we're given, as well as the, the devastation, we've got this stasis, this, this pool, still pool of water, which lots of landscape artists use. Uh, it creates, it gives you an excuse to have a reflection, but it also leads the viewer in. And it, you, manage, you manage to um, uh, have that feeling of, of calm. Now, this, this is very much the scene after, after the battle. Uh, you've got the searchlights in the background and we can see some, some smoke. And just two figures. Now, the way he's using his figures, I said he was not uh, someone that was not very comfortable in painting the human figure. Um, he's using them more as staffage. When, when you use figures to enliven a landscape, it, it's called staffage. So this is a landscape painter responding to uh, his experiences and changing his style dramatically because he couldn't, or he felt that he couldn't paint in his old way of painting. And in fact, you know, certain artists make those those sorts of statements about the experiences, um, the experiences of war. For example, uh, Max Ernst said, um, you know, Max Ernst uh, died uh, in 1914 and comes back to life in 1918. So what else he'd served at the front and obviously serving on on opposite sides. And that, you know, is the irony. I've already mentioned a couple of uh, German artists, Gross and Dix, who, who paint. And of course, people like John Hartfield, who eventually settles in Britain, and George Gross, were furious and angry about the propaganda <coughs> that was being used by Germany and by England to, to get both young German men and young English men to go and fight these, these battles. Okay, so we'll just look at a couple of other by uh, by Paul Nash. This is his Spring in the Trenches, um, where we've got perhaps a little, just a, a little hint uh, of revival. Uh, two soldiers here in the bottom, uh, trees in the background, and just a little hint of, of nature. Nature coming back, nature will always regain itself. I mean, that's another thing with landscape painting. Look at artists like Claude de Poussin and that kind of uh, idealised landscape. It's very much about man being control, able to control nature, where in actual fact, as, as we know, that, that really isn't um, the way it is, that nature will have her own, but she will always come back. And then I think we have one other, just one other Nash, which is his mule track of 1917. And here you've got those blasts, so it's a, it's almost monochrome, but you've got the kind of stylization of, of mud and water in the middle ground, and then you've got blasts of stones and blasts of orange coming through. It, it, it really, this too, uh, if we think about a kind of Boschian image of hell, you know, think about the Haywain or uh, the Garden of Earthly Delights, and the the panel on the right, those images of hell. This is something that relates very much to that. Um, and within that melee, you've got horses, men, uh, machines, and it's it, it's trying to, to create that effect for the viewer and highly, highly success, successful, I would say. OK, so we're going to move on now to some images by William Orpen. Uh, William Orpen was of Irish background. Um, he joins up, he be, he, he's in World War One, 
uh, he actually donates um, money to the government. And in 1950, uh, he joins the Army Service Corps. He has a lot of connections, um, just quite sort of well to do. And he goes to war as a major. As I said, many of the war artists went for a three week period and they would go as second lieutenants. But 1917, he finds himself on the Somme uh, and then later in Amiens, where he said about the Somme, it was bones, skulls and garments, a literal graveyard. Now, he went back after his first um, call and then goes back again in 1918. And um, in 1919, he actually goes back to paint the peace conference and he was highly critical of it. He couldn't um, he couldn't believe that um, his experiences, what he'd seen, were just being discussed in this calm and cold manner. So we're, we're going to look through a couple of other, a couple of images of, of William Orpen. Uh, this is one of his self-portraits, but you know, as you can see, this is uh, an image of of horror. And here we have the the, the open mouth. Uh, a far more, um, we could say, far more representational image. Here he is in his great coat, and you'll notice. So you've got the, uh, you know, the idea of the soldier, uh, and here um, he's got his sort of pencil and pad in his hand, but looking out at the at the viewer. Um, but as we see, you know, almost saying to us, "Well, I'm actually recording recording this." Um, and here too, we were presented with something that is both a portrait, but has that, it's juxtaposed between a domestic scene and a still life, little elements of himself. And perhaps, you know, is it, is it a photograph, is it painting um, of, his, of himself before he, he goes to war? In the background, you've got these, these silhouettes. But they they have that ironic twist, as you can see. He's he's looking at the viewer. He's almost saying to us, you know, this is the way I'm I'm going to to guide you. Now this is one that he did of dead Germans, and this was acceptable. He does this in in nineteen in nineteen seventeen. Um, so here we have a you know a body, the dead body, but a German body, and. Um, Again, this sort of idea, as he said, to uh, to go back to the you know bones, skulls, garments that everything he saw was a literal a literal graveyard, and that was a, a detail of of this that we're that we're looking at here, which is of of Sonnebecker. But then we'll see that he takes rather a, an ironic twist, and this one is called the Thinker on the Boot of Varancourt. Um, you've got that classical image of the thinker, the philosopher, and he's taken the soldier. So he's making something that is a very heroic. Um, he's, he's, he's taking the soldier. and This is not, um, uh, you know, a soldier who's been taken up or, or decorated, etc. It's just the commoner garden soldier with his his pack, but he's he's sitting on top of a mound, surveying what's what's around him, and and thinking and contemplating on it. Um, so we've got another reference or a classical reference, um, and then what we might think of almost as a as a kind of burlesque, uh, the Armistice Night in in Amiens of nineteen eighteen, um, where you've got searchlights but here they're being used to light the sky because the um the, the war has been announced to to be to be over and then just to look at these two images he went as we said in 1919 uh it went to the peace conference at versailles and produces this image well it did not go down well as you can see uh you've got all this grandness um uh, but in the centre, you've got the coffin to the unknown soldier with the helmet on it. But at either side, you have 
two naked figures who are posing uh, rather like um, a, um, a David. These, these look rather like Donatello's David. So they, and they're a slightly effeminate pose using their, their rifles and with just a small amount of drapery. Well, this was seen as quite blasphemous. And in fact, he, he repaints um, when you, this still exists, when you can just sort of see a, almost like a palimpsest in it. Uh, and the soldiers are removed. Um, this was the official piece that he did. OK, so just good to have a look at um, and here we've got the got them both both together. OK, so to look now at uh, John Singer Sargent's um, Gast. Sargent, as we know, um, was an American born in um, born in Italy, uh, had moved to live in Paris, left Paris because of the scandal over Madame X and comes to uh, comes to England and produces in 1919 uh, probably one of the uh, mem most memorable images of the of the war. It's called gas. It's a very large scale image, the kind of uh, kind of image that you would have um, as a history painting. And in fact, you can think of it as a modern history painting, but here he is showing the reality of war. And um, in the foreground, you've got the soldiers who are lying down, uh, you know, their heads are bandaged. bandaged. And behind them, uh, those who are having their, having their eyes covered, um, being led, being led by an able-bodied soldier, but also hanging on to each other. And he... These are these are life size figures. It's it's in the Imperial War Museum, um, and it's it's a very strong image of the futility of war. Um, and he too he takes this from another Bruegel painting of the blind leading the blind. So it's it, it's another really ironic comment um, on the war. In Bruegel's painting, there is a church in the background, and the peasants are all blindfolded. And they're falling into a ditch. So this is this is where Sergeant takes the um, so you, again looking to the past. And these are just some of the sketches that he did um, for uh, for Gast, as we can see here. Um, okay, now just going to have we haven't got a lot of time left, so I'm going to have a look at just quite uh, quite quite. Quickly, a couple of images by William Rothenstein. We mentioned him right, uh, right in the right in the beginning, uh, and saying how you know he was involved in because he was quite um, established. He he was an official war artist. He was on the Western Front, but he recorded mostly the devastation to both the British and Canadians. He was very well connected. He had a, he was a great friend of Magnus Donner's. Um, he was a great friend of, of Beaverbrook. Um, and he was quite influential, um, or oh, Donis was quite influential in his appointment. So we're just going to have a look at a couple of these images which um, William Rothenstein produced, and then just because I wanted to move on. So that was the um, bombed houses. This is his landscape with blasted trees. Uh, and another um, image very similar to how we started. So as you say, these are taken in situ, but they're quite repetitive in terms of their motif. But one of the artists that does do something that's very different is David Jones. And David Jones produced a book called In Parenthesis, which was actually Book of the Week. Um, oh, about two years ago, it was being, it was being read. Um, it was about his experiences in the First World War. He was Welsh, he enlisted in the Royal Welsh Fusiliers uh, in 1915, and he served until 1918. He was on the Western Front. Uh, his health and his mental state were shattered by the war. And in fact, he has breakdowns, pretty um, ongoing. Um, and in fact, apparently would, after the war, after his war experience, he would always wear 
his overcoat. It didn't matter where he went, he would have that with him. And he would carry a body of his work with him. Well, his, his work, as you can see, he, he, he takes this, this almost shattered culture, Western culture, and there, you've got something that is quite idiosyncratic. They're watercolours. Um, they often are connected with, not collage exactly, but we mentioned Eliot's Wasteland, the way you've got that throwing together of images. Um, this is really what Jones does. He piles images on images so that, you know, in something like this, that we can make out little bits of barbed wire. We can also make out part of a, a semi-naked body. And then in the background, you can see fragments of clothed bodies. And then you can see, you know, figures, um, smaller figures walking away into the distance. It's, it is that, we mentioned palimpsest before, it's as if he takes something and then goes with it and then almost does a ghost of that thing. And probably the one image that um, brings that together is, is this one, which is Aphrodite in Olis. Now he does this in 1940, but what we've got is this, this goddess right at the centre surrounded by um, blasted um, so we can see columns, uh, blasted bodies, you've got references to uh, Roman soldiers, you've got references to First World War soldiers, it's painted in 1940, the whole thing is, is starting to get. Really what Jones is talking about is the destruction of Western culture, you know, the this this is this is the bottom line. He's been through it once. It's happening again, and actually, all you're going to be left with is is devastation and and death. Now we're just going to have very quickly uh, a look at a few images by by Stanley Spencer, and this is the, the last artist that we'll that we'll look at. I mentioned how Spencer was at the Slade. Uh, he volunteered in 1915. He was in the Royal Army Medical Corps as an ambulance man. First of all, he was an orderly as a, hotel, a hospital in Bristol, and then he's, he's in the field ambulance unit, and he's on the front line. Uh, 1918, he's invalided out. Uh, this painting is one that he started before the First World War. The top two thirds were painted before the war, uh, and he paints the, the bottom piece when he comes back in 1920. Uh, or he paints it in 1920, and it's called Swan Upping. Um, and those of you who've been to Spencer's um, hometown um, and the Spencer Spencer Memorial will recognise the bridge. Um, what he's showing is a ritual, and this ritual had happened before the war, and it, it's happening after the war. But he's probably remembered for the work that he did at the Sandham uh, Memorial Chapel which was, uh, but it's a National Trust property now, so we're just looking at a couple of sketches. But he does this series of paintings um, that were um, done at the Sandon Memorial Chapel. Um, looking at work by Giotto in, in, um, in Padua, which was, you know, very influential for him. Now, he worked in Macedonia. He'd been two and a half years on the front. And this one is the... Uh, Travois arriving um, in 19, 1919, and in fact he did this particular painting. Uh, he was it was supposed to be going into a hall of remembrance, but that was not built. And in fact, Ethan Spencer talks about um, the horror of the war, but he said it's also it was also about redemption. It's often a religious motif. But what we've got here, we've got quite a high viewpoint, and we are. We are looking down um, and we're looking through to an operating arena. And as you can see, uh, you've got you as a dressing station. So the bodies are being dealt with. And Spencer, who always gets the everyday, um, he always seems to manage to introduce the ev everyday motif. Um, 
you've got the horses gazing on. It's almost as if, as if they are they are being entertained, but behind them, uh, the next group of bodies that are going to be that are going to be dealt with. Now he was employed to uh, paint uh, this small chapel, um, and it's in Beau um, Beauclair. And you can go and see it. You think you can have about twelve people in at a time, but it's painted like a Renaissance chapel, top to bottom. And you know, one of the themes in in um, Spencer's work is about resurrection and redemption. So here um, we've got, as we can see, the uh, the crosses. But if we look at the graves. The soldiers are starting to actually. Um, rise up. So he's saying, well, as we said to quote him, that it was it was not the horror that what he wanted to capture, but actually the redemption. And a little figure on the right is very like Spencer. He often he often includes includes himself. These are quite large scale images um, and they they capture the elements of, of the everyday. This is the, the chapel um, which was um, 90, it's actually built in 1926. So the image we've just been looking at, as you can see, is on the on the far wall. And then we have um, a lot of everyday imagery, and I think we have a couple that we can look at. You know, so you know, here, this is the the men going about their ablutions, but also as we can see, iodine and other things being put onto um, wounds, etc. But it's that concept that whilst the war is going on, everyday life happens as well. Uh, there's that um, painting of Mrs. Mounter at the breakfast table uh, by Gilman, which I'm sure a lot of you know. Gilman couldn't go to war. Both of his brothers were in the war. And he was very embarrassed at not being able to go to the war. But he paints Mrs. Mounter, who was his landlady at the time, and he says this is the war action where the war action isn't. In other words, you you sit and drink tea. But Stanley Spencer similarly shows that even when you're the other side of the line at the war, the everyday goes on. You know, and here, you know, here's you've got people even sort of rubbing the, the tap with their with their towel, people washing their hair, uh, people are going about their, their everyday. And here too, um, you've got, um, as we can see, the wounded in the background. And given that Spencer um, worked um, for, for the medical corps, but you know, we could be at a school tea. You know, this could be a, a Bloomsbury painting of, of tea in tea in the nursery. And then this is his bed making. So, so here too. Um, you know, we're taken to an almost domestic setting, but then we notice that the, you know, the figure on the right is is just dressed in a in a smock, and the figure on the in the centre with his back to us is is still dressed in his sort of battle fatigues. And then we've got the the figure that's that's covered up and probably injured, waiting for his bed to be made, warming warming his feet. Um, and I think we have perhaps just one. Uh, one or two, I think we had another couple, another couple of these. Yeah, so here again, another shot. Now you can see you know, some of the images we've looked at. Um, it is like going to somewhere like Padua um, and going to going into the Scriveni Chapel. Here we've got the bed making, uh, bed making at the bottom um, on right. And I think that was just one of the. Uh, yeah, one of the sketches, we just have a very, 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 very quick look at um, this image by um, Bomberg, which Bomberg was commissioned to um, to paint the sappers. Um, and he he does this, uh, he does an initial one, uh, which is re rejected, but then reworks it. Um, just looking at the time here as well. This one um, and the one that he does after it, are now part of the of Tate Modern. I mean, we could we could go on. A lot of artists responded to the war, and as we've seen, they they did it in in a very in, in their their own individual ways, which often depended on perhaps the the oeuvre that they worked in initially, but similarly their own responses to to war.